All right, we're gonna get started. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Newson, and I'm a partner at BOS and also the host of our Perspectives podcast. On behalf of all of us at BOS, we hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe as we navigate this truly extraordinary time in our shared history. There is also so much to be grateful for, and I would like to express our collective gratitude to the clients of the firm attending today, as it is the trust you place in us that gives us the opportunity to serve you, your families, and those that you care about. Thank you. Leading today's discussion will be my colleague, Michelle Soto. Michelle is the firm's Director of Financial Planning and oversees internal education, financial planning, and technology projects with the aim of providing exceptional client advice in areas such as estate planning, tax strategies, equity compensation, risk management, education funding, and retirement planning. Michelle is joined by our resident estate planning expert, Judith Gordon. Judy joined the firm after a 35-year legal career in sophisticated estate and gift tax planning, charitable planning, and probate and trust administration. She provides consulting advice for private clients and advisors on wealth transfer strategies, tax planning opportunities, and trust in estate administration. Before we welcome Michelle and Judy, I do have some disclosures about today's presentation I am required to share. The content presented today, December 3rd, 2020, is for informational purposes only. This presentation provides a general overview of California's Proposition 19 and is not intended to be used as a source of any specific recommendations and makes no implied or express recommendations concerning the manner in which any individual situations should be handled as strategies depend upon the individual's specific objectives and circumstances. This presentation does not constitute a solicitation to enter into an investment agreement with BOS. It is your responsibility to consult with your legal, tax, and financial professionals to seek appropriate advice for your particular circumstances. Opinions expressed in this presentation are current opinions as of today, which are not reliable as fact and are subject to change. For more details, please see bosinvest.com slash disclosures. And now moving on to today's scintillating topic, navigating California's Prop 19's new property tax rules. Michelle and Judy will begin by reviewing the legislation leading to Prop 19, followed by changes, changes to parent to child property transfers and transferring principal residence assessed values for those age 55 plus, as well as the disabled. Finally, we will kick off a Q&A session and take questions directly from you via the Q&A feature in Zoom. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Michelle Soto and Judy Gordon. David, thanks so much for kicking us off and that warm welcome. And Judy and I want to thank all of you, the attendees, for joining us this morning. Our goal is to share a lot of information with you around an important topic, California Proposition 19. So Judy, uh, it's helpful to know where we're starting from. Where, what are some of the relevant property tax rules that were in place before Prop 19 should take effect? Good morning, everyone. A discussion of California property tax rules typically traces its way back to Prop 13. Prop 13 was the landmark amendment to the California Constitution that was enacted in 1978 through the legislative process. Prop 13 limits the tax rate for uh, real, real estate so that the rate doesn't exceed 1% of the full cash value of the property. Prop 13 also decreased property tax uh, values back to assessing property um, values back to 1976 values and also restricted annual increases to no more than 2% per year. Prop 13 also prohibits a reassessment of the base year value unless there is what's called a change in ownership or completion of new construction. These rules on Prop 13 apply to all real estate in California, whether residential or commercial, and whether owned by individuals or by corporations. It's interesting because under Prop 13, different neighbors um, in your neighborhood can different have different property taxes paid for their real estate. For example, if you had a neighbor who bought their home in the early uh, 2000s, let's say for 600,000 for a three bedroom, two bath home, 
uh, they may be paying only $6,000 a year roughly in property taxes. The other neighbor who bought the same kind of home last year for $2 million could pay roughly $20,000 million, excuse me, twenty dollars in, in property taxes based on um, an assessed value of $2 million. So that's a difference in $14,000 in property taxes annually uh, for the taxpayer with, with similar types of homes. It's important to remember that Prop 13, the basics of Prop 13 were not affected or changed by Prop 19. What Prop 19 did was change the rules on other propositions in California that affect the assessed value under different change of ownership situations. So Judy, you mentioned the phrase assessed value. I think for the sake of the presentation, um, since we're gonna be mentioning these concepts often, I wanna set some definitions. So first there's base year value. And this is the value from 1976 per Prop 13 for much older properties, or it's the purchase price of a property, which will be subject to annual inflation adjustments. And then as you mentioned, there's assessed values. And this is either the base year value subject to annual inflation adjustments, or upon a change in ownership, the new fair market value. So it's important to have these concepts in mind because like you said, Judy, this is what uh, Prop 19 is, is changing. So what are some of the other propositions that have been affected by Prop 19? Well, the, as you'll see on these charts, there's a whole host of them and we're gonna go through them um, at this point pretty quickly because we wanna spend our time on focusing on what the changes to these different propositions are based on the passage of Prop 19. Well, first we have uh, the, probably the one most people have heard about, which is Prop 58. Prop 58 is the proposition passed in 1986 that allowed certain transfers of real property between parent and children uh, to be made without triggering a change in ownership resulting in property tax assessments. There's generally two parts of this, the part where you can chain, uh, transfer your primary residence to your children regardless of uh, value or how many times you do that without triggering a reassessment. And then there's also the second part of it that allows you to transfer property other than your primary residence, being vacation homes or rental properties or commercial properties to your children, with each transfer or having a limit of transferring $1 million of assessed value. Prop 193 expanded on Prop uh, 58 uh, in 1996 and broadened the tax relief for certain situations where parents transfer to grant or grandparents transfer to their grandchildren. And that really depends if, um, if the child is deceased. Uh, in addition, uh, we have Prop 60, which allowed homeowners who are 55 years of age or older to sell their principal residence uh, one time and transfer their base year value of their property to a replacement residence of equal or lesser value um, that's purchased or newly constructed within two years within the same county. Prop 990 expanded on Prop 60 in 1988, which allowed transfers of uh, this tax basis on your primary residence uh, between counties, though there are only 10 counties in California that uh, allow that, and it's the county in which you buy your new residence uh, that has to allow for inter, uh, intra-county transfers. Uh, then we have Prop Prop 110, I'm gonna go back, just uh, Prop 110 uh, expanded this relief for uh, transferring your tax basis for primary residence for severely and permanently disabled people. And then we also have Prop uh, 50 that uh, gave similar relief for people whose homes were destroyed by wildfire or other disasters declared by the, the governor. Uh, in the same county, and then Prop 171 in 1993 added inter-county transfer provisions similar to the protections offered by Prop 50. So you can see there's a whole host of propositions that uh, protect the assessed value as not being subject to reassessment under certain conditions. Uh, Judy, thanks for taking us through all of that. I'm glad that there's no quiz at the end of this all because that is a lot of legislative change. Uh, but I think it does speak to the nature of how this has evolved over time. So, you know, let's start talking about the changes made by Prop 19 um, 
and it's really impacting the ability of heirs uh, to keep their assessed values low um, from generation to generation, uh, thus leading to lower property taxes. And as we said in the example that, you know, where we are now is that these transferred assessed values are oftentimes lower than what it would be, you know, given current market values. So it's a, a significant change. Yes. So first we're going to focus on the part of Prop 19 that affected uh, the transfer of property from parent to children, uh, either during lifetime as by gift or by sale or when someone dies. With Prop 19, uh, the exclusion of property other than your primary residence is gone. So as before under Prop 58, each person could transfer up to a million dollars of assessed value to their children. A uh, married couple would have $2 million. That's gone totally. The second part of it is with regard to the principal residence. Uh, so now that's much more limited. Uh, first of all, you have to qualify for uh, the exclusion. And the way you would qualify for the exclusion is that when someone gives you the property or when, uh, when the parent uh, dies and you inherit the property, in order to even begin to qualify for this exclusion, the child's gonna have to move into the residence. And then even after they move into the residence, uh, the exclusion will be determined based on what the value of the property is at the time. Okay. okay. So Prop 19's changes to these parent-child transfers, they become effective as of February 16, 2021 and after. So Judy, what happens to transfers if they were completed before Prop 19 takes effect, before February 16? Well, as Michelle mentioned, the effective date of this proposition is February 16th, 2021. It's interesting because um, this year, uh, because we've got the President's Day holiday, February 16th is on a Tuesday, the holidays on Monday. So we just got to have to keep these uh, dates, dates in mind in terms of uh, thinking about making transfers. But for anyone who um, has uh, either received their property already, or is going to complete a transfer before that date, uh, the old rules will be in effect. So here's an example. We've got Sally who inherited her mother's home in San Francisco in 1991 and made the home her principal residence. She filed and received the California Proposition 58 parent-child exclusion and maintains her mother's assessed value for the property tax purposes. Since Prop 19 is effective for transfers after February 15th, Sally doesn't have to worry she gets to keep her low assessed value and she's not gonna be affected by the passage of Proposition 19. So I think that's some good news to folks that have already experienced these property transfers. It's not a concept of uh, grandfathering, right? It's not, it's not right. climbing back. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, not gonna, it's not gonna go back and, and grab the people who have inherited properties and already claim the Prop 58 exclusion. Exactly. Okay, so we have another example here and it's identifying again, this importance of the February 16, 2021 effective date. All right, so in this case, uh, you know, Sally's gonna die uh, in a few days and Holly's her daughter and she's gonna inherit the property. Um, if, and this is gonna still be a question, you would think that because Sally died before the effective date that Holly, Holly should inherit the property with the mother's assessed value and pay the same property taxes as the mother was, um, was paying. There's still somewhat of a question as to uh, whether the paperwork on this transfer has also has to be completed before the effective date. So these are some of the rules that we're still waiting to hear from the State Board of Equalization. Uh, um, they're scrambling like many people to kind of figure out this legislation. Uh, they weren't the ones who started it. Uh, it was uh, promoted by others. So they're busy uh, in their offices right now trying to figure out all these rules. But we would hope that since Sally died before that date, that Holly's going to be, uh, you know, under uh, the old rules, and hopefully she sees her attorney and files the paperwork before February fifteenth. Uh, okay, so here's an important concept. So Prop 19's rules for setting new assessed values depend on whether or not the current fair market value of the property of the home is one million dollars greater than 
or less than the original assessed value. So we have a couple of examples here that we can you know, look at to explain this concept further. But again, as Judy said, it's based upon our current interpretation of the rules. Again, the Board of Equalization, they're gonna come out with more guidance shortly. You know, Prop 19 passed just over a month ago. So we're really, you know, it's a moving target, but we're paying close attention. So let me show this slide here. And, you know, it's an example where the difference between the fair market value of the home and the original assessed value is less than a million dollars. You know, so to continue with our example, you know, we have Sally the mom and she passes away on March 1st, 2021. And then her daughter Holly inherits Sally's home. So here's an important concept as well. Holly, if she moves into Sally's home, she needs to use it as her principal residence so that she has the lower property tax calculation. She can basically carry over the mom's property tax. And you see here, uh, she's moved in and it's the assessed value, $1 million times a 1% annual property tax rate, yielding in the same amount of annual property taxes as her mom paid. Now, if Holly does not move into the home and does not use it as her principal residence, now you're gonna calculate property taxes differently. You're gonna take the fair market value, which is $1.9 million times the property rate, top property tax rate, and it'll be 19,000 in annual property taxes. So, you know, an increase there. I wanna make one additional comment on that. Uh, some people, you know, have been asking, what does that mean for it to be considered a principal residence for the parents' residence uh, before they die to be their principal residence? And how does the child uh, confirm that it is their principal residence. Uh, the general rule is that uh, you have to qualify and apply for the homeowner's exemption in order for it to be your principal residence. If you look at your property tax bill, you may note that on that form, if you've applied for this exemption, you get a very small reduction. I think it's $7,000, which translates into $70 a year um, off your property taxes. But that's generally the determinative factor as to whether the home will be your principal residence. So some people don't even apply for that. So you may want to go back and uh, make sure that that box has been checked off or the form has been um, filled out with, with your county to make sure that you are getting the uh, homeowner's exemption. Yeah, thanks for that, Judy. That was definitely one of the questions we've received uh, prior to uh, the webinar today. So, you know, to finish up this concept, now we've got an example where the fair market value and then the assessed value, uh, the fair market value is now more than 1 million. So now we have Sally's principal residence, it's $6 million in fair market value. And then the original assessed value was at 1 million. And so her property tax rates were $10,000. Same fact pattern as before, uh, Sally, passes away March 1st, her daughter Holly inherits the home. So if Holly moves into Sally's home as her new principal residence, her property tax is calculated as this. There's the $6 million fair market value minus a $1 million exemption. And now you've got 5 million times the 1% property tax rate for $50,000 in property taxes. If she doesn't move into the home, then it's the fair market value, the $6 million times 1% uh, for property taxes, annual property taxes of $60,000. I mean, so here you, you can see how there's a lot at stake. There's, you know, significant change in how many, how much property taxes children are going to pay or beneficiaries are going to pay than um, what we had before Prop 19. So again, this really stresses the urgency around February 16. People wanna preserve these lower property tax rates if they can. Um, and so we'll be going into possible strategies to do these transfers before Prop 19 takes effect. So, you know, one thing, Judy, lots of our clients, they have properties that, you know, given California real estate, these properties have appreciated quite a bit. And you know, the game plan had been, why don't we wait until we pass away, you know, pass the homes to our children or to our heirs, because at that point, the homes will get a step up in basis, you know, which really means that 
you know, you have your cost basis, you know, you bought the house for X amount, you added on improvements. Um, so that sets a cost basis, but then upon death, it gets stepped up to the fair market value at that time. Then the children or the heirs, when they inherit that property, they can go ahead and sell the home really soon and they won't occur much in the terms of realized capital gains. So, you know, that's a very big financial benefit. So Judy, how do you weigh, you know, on one hand, I want to hold out and pass these properties upon my death so that my beneficiaries, my children get the step up in basis, you know, that's on one hand. But then on the other hand, if we do these transfers before February 16, you know, then they may be able to keep our low assessed value, keep our low annual property taxes, knowing that I have to give up this concept of step up in basis. You know, how do we weigh, how do you make that decision? Shelly, I mean, that's a really good question. And uh, you know, unfortunately, there's no simple answer. You know, it Never really is. is, you know, a case by case basis. I think you said it quite nicely that you're kind of balancing uh, the step up in basis versus an increase in annual property taxes. But it, it's, it's harder than that because there's so many things that can ha happen in between. Uh, first of all, we don't even know that for years to come that property will get a step up in basis. Uh, on Biden's tax legislation uh, platform, there's been a talk about uh, repealing step up in, in basis. Um, also with regards to um, the tax rules, uh, Prop 19 is here with us today. Um, it doesn't mean that it's going to be here with us forever. I think when people finally realize what this really did, it, this goes back to kind of uh, how the legislation was promoted, people what they really thought was going to happen. Um, it's possible that there'll be further uh, revisions or changes to the way this whole system you know, works. And also when you talk about your primary residence, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of factors there. If you've got several children uh, and this ability for one happening to move into the property as their primary residence to get some, you know, benefit of a lower um, assessment kind of, you know, down the road or whether who you're going to give the property to now, you know, it's a difficult and, uh, you know, complex uh, conversation. So I think that the best thing is to just kind of just think about it after uh, you know this presentation, you'll have a little bit better idea of what the rules are, what the uh, pros and cons are, and have uh, take some time to talk about it with your family, and then definitely with your advisor and see you know what is the appropriate uh, planning scenario you know for your family. Yeah, that's a good point. You really have to start at the the fifty thousand foot level, um, but there are probably going to be families that after having these conversations, they realize that, you know what, my children, you know, the next generation, you know, they might want to move in as a pro as a primary residence, or they want to continue holding that vacation home. It's something that we want to keep, you know, within the family for generations to come. Um, and they prioritize the annual property taxes remaining low. So, I, you know, our next couple of slides, I think, speaks to these people that want to transfer these assessed values, you know, before Prop 19. Oh, definitely. You know, again, I've always thought that um, there are, uh, you know, many reasons to, to transfer property, you know, early and uh, to get the appreciation out of your state for estate tax purposes, to allow for, for good transition, uh, over the, over the time. So I think that, you know, Prop 19 planning is gonna be appropriate for, for many, many, many families. So um, we wanted to go through, you know, just a couple uh, different scenarios that people, you know, could consider. Um, we've talked already about just a direct transfer. You know, it's very, very possible that you could give your property directly to, um, you know, a child, as Michelle mentioned, certainly if it's a property that's going to be held in the family and not be sold, you know, uh, soon after death, there could be very good reasons uh, for the property tax assessment to be uh, a priority and to keep that that low and transferred early. Um, but there are some other techniques that people may want to consider. And one of those is uh, using entities. 
So in this example, you know, we have a family who owns a Tahoe vacation home. They've had it for many years. So the property taxes um, are qu quite low compared to the fair market value of the property. Uh, they go up there every you know, winter and summer, and it's very clear that they're going to continue to want to use the family uh, cabin as a retreat after uh, the parents pass away. So one technique that you could uh, consider and discuss with, with your advisor uh, is the following. Before the effective date of the new legislation, we've got Bruce and Liz, they're the parents. They could make an outright transfer of 26% of the property to, to each of their children. The property could be given directly to the children or to trusts for the children's benefit. There's a type of trust called a generation skipping trust that the child would have the benefit of the use of the property during their lifetime, but then the property would be excluded uh, from the value of their estate for federal estate tax purposes when the child dies. When the first transfer of the 26% interest is made to uh, Tom and Christine, uh, with that paperwork, uh, pre-February 16th, parents, parents would file the Prop 58 parent-child exclusion form, and that portion of the property would be covered with the exemption. That's step one. Uh, all four parties, parents and children, they could also enter into a tenants in common agreement, which I think is important when you have uh, multiple owners of a property where you can define the rights and responsibilities, who's going to pay for what, when you get to use the property, you know, that type of thing. So they enter into agreement for management of the property. Then after uh, time has passed, uh, hopefully, you know, into next, uh, the following year, uh, the four parties, Bruce, Liz, Tom, and Christine, they could form an entity, an LLC, and each of them would transfer their respective interest in the Tahoe property to the LLC. You know, at this point, the parents have 48%, the children have 52%. Upon the transfer to the LLC, there also won't be any reassessment of the property for property tax purposes. That's under a different set of rules through property tax assessment, uh, generally when they're what we call a proportionate transfer of interest from people to an entity. So if I own 25% or 26% and I transfer my part and everyone else does the same, and there's no mixing of uh, ownerships from what you had before to what it is in the entity, there will be no reassessment. So now at this point, we have uh, the property in an entity, which is really a good idea for, for many purposes. There could be some liability protection associated with holding the property in the entity. Um, it also uh, makes it easier to transfer future interests in the property. Uh, when the children die and their interests go to their children, you're not constantly doing deeds, having multiple owners, uh, the entity still owns the property. But once the property's in the entity, and then when Bruce and Liz die, their remaining interest in the entity can pass to their children without the property being reassessed for property tax purposes. And that's because of two other rules that are in the uh, realm of these entity transfer rules. One is that there hasn't been a transfer of more than 50% of the original co-owner's interest. So when that, when, if you don't cross 50% of the original co-owner's interest, you're not gonna have a change in uh, uh, property tax purposes. And in this particular situation, no one person has con uh, obtained control of more than 50% of the interest in the entity. That's another rule. So with this particular fact pattern, what we've achieved is a transfer of some of the property before the effective date, covering it with the Prop 58 exemption, then putting it into the entity in such a way that we, uh, when the parents die and the entity interests are transferred to the children, that won't also uh, result in a reassessment of the property. So bottom line is Tahoe property stays in the family and the taxes will stay low. Judy, what's your advice to our attendees that are listening to this? You know, maybe they, they grasp the concept at a very high level, you know, like how could they take action on something like this? Oh, they have to see their, <laughs> they uh, have to talk about it with their family, make sure people want to be involved in this, their other family members. Uh, and then they, you know, need to talk to their financial advisor more on their particulars, again, with information in hand. Okay, you want to want to know what your property's worth, what your property tax is have been, get copies of your property tax bill so you can share that information with, with the attorney or your advisor. 
Um, and then just again, talk about your particulars and uh, see if this is something that you want to uh, embark upon. Okay. Um, so another uh, strategy that I want to talk just a little bit about, but first just you know to reiterate, I mean, the purpose of today's presentation is uh, to present an overview of the current situation on property tax rules in California, uh, the changes that Prop 19 has made, and some kind of just basic strategies to uh, take advantage of the old rules before the new rules go into effect. And what we've talked about so far is uh, you know, outright transfers before the effective date. We talked a little bit about using entities to lock in assessments. And there's another possible strategy that, uh, that, that is out there that many people are uh, kind of reviewing and talking about, and that's something called an incomplete gifting trust. So it may be possible to set up an irrevocable trust for the benefit of a child and transfer your property, uh, generally, let's just work with a vacation home or investment property to that trust. And it will be considered a completed transfer for property tax purposes. You'll file the paperwork and you'll get your Prop 58 exemption um, and you'll get this done before the effective date. However, the provisions of the trust are written in such a way that the grantor, the person who owns the property, when they transfer the property in, that they're gonna retain certain powers over that trust, either the power to change the beneficiaries or something called a power of appointment or some other powers that will deem the gift to the trust what we call incomplete for gift tax purposes. So what that means is that when the property is transferred to the trust, it won't be considered a completed gift. You won't use up any of your gift exemption at that point. It may happen kind of down the road, but you won't use up any gift tax exemption then. And then if the trust is designed properly and implemented properly, if you follow all the rules, which your attorney will discuss with you, when the donor dies, the property will be includable or should be includable in the donor's estate and be eligible for the step up in basis. So with this strategy, you're trying to get both, the best of both worlds. You're trying to set up a technique where you get the benefit of the lower property tax assessed values because you're doing this before the effective date of the new legislation, but you're doing it in such a way with the hope that if done properly, the property will be includable in, a, in the estate of the person that dies and there will be the opportunity for a step up in basis. Now that sounds great, but again, this isn't for everyone because when property is includable in someone's estate, the value can be higher. There's some other things that could happen, but it is a strategy that many um, attorneys are, uh, are looking at. Uh, you know, one caveat on this is also with going back to the Board of uh, Equalization. The Board of Equalization is gonna come out with a bunch of rules and those rules are gonna affect the terms of these trusts and what powers the donor can have uh, with regard to uh, the property that's in the trust, if it's rental income, where that money goes, all sorts of things. So I wanted to mention this technique because you may be hearing about it. And I think it's a, it's a great technique in the right situation, you know, if done properly. I get the sense that estate planning attorneys are gonna be quite busy. No vacation, no, well, people are home anyway, but <laughs> many people um, <laughs> will not be taking vacation, you know, through February. That's right. That's right. Uh, so Judy, we spent most of the presentation talking about the parent-child transfer changes from Prop 19, um, but there's another aspect here. Uh, Prop 19, it's allowing homeowners over the age 55, um, also the disabled, also victims of disaster, to take their assessed value with them when they sell their home and uh, bring it with them uh, when they purchase a new one. And you know, we went through the previous rules and you know, this concept has been in place, but to a limited degree, you know, like you said, 10 out of 58 California counties were participating. Um, you know, but now moving forward, Prop 19 has opened it up to all of California, um, which should keep uh, you know, real estate activity high moving forward. So you know, let's take a look at you know, some of the precedents before the changes coming from Prop 19. Okay, good. All right. Well, 
I like this part because first we uh, we talked kind of about the bad news. Now this is the kind of the good news uh, part of the presentation. The yes, so uh, we had Prop 60 and 90. Uh, Prop 60 allowed uh, uh, you, someone who's over 50, 55 or older, to take their base value uh, with them if they bought a new property. However, it was limited to properties that you purchased that were of equal or lesser value. Uh, there were a lot of issues in, in making sure that you met that and uh, fair market value was not necessarily, or, or the sales price, excuse me, or the purchase price of the new property was not necessarily determined of a fair market value that the county could come in and say something else. So there were a lot of stumbling blocks. Um, you could only do it once. Um, and again, as Michelle mentioned, you had to do it in the same county or in these 10 other counties. Well, it's opened up. So now uh, we no longer have to be concerned about the, uh, in part about the purchase price of the new property. Um, we're gonna go through some examples of how the tax will be calculated if the purchase price of the new property is higher than the old property. You can take your basis and move anywhere in California that you want. You don't have to worry of whether or not the uh, county that you're gonna move to uh, it takes reciprocity and you can do it three times. And yeah, that's a big expansion. A big expansion. And there is an effective date, a different effective date. Um, we've been talking about the February 16th effective date for uh, the parent child transfers. The effective date for uh, the over 55 transfer base values is effective as of April 1, 2021. So that's a different date. Okay. Okay. So um, Judy, does it matter if you hold the home in title of a trust? You know, does that make a difference? You know, can you still leverage this aspect of Prop 19? Definitely. So in this example, we've got Amanda who is, you know, she's uh, set up a revocable trust as many has as a uh, kind of a will alternative. Uh, certainly if her home is titled in, the in her name as trustee of the trust, she can file a claim to transfer the assessed value. Um, as long as Amanda is the uh, beneficial owner of that trust, she gets to take her property tax basis with her. Okay, so let's go into how we calculate, you know, the new property tax basis after a move. Uh, we've got a couple of examples here. And our first one is what if I move to a less expensive home? All right, well, if you move to a less expensive home, it's, it's pretty easy, it's the same as the old rules. In this case, uh, you know, we have Jason um, and he lives uh, in a home that his current home is uh, 6 million, he's got an assessed value of 1 million, he's over 55, he's 67, uh, he wants to downsize and he moves to a new home with a fair market value of $4 million. Uh, filing the proper paperwork on time uh, in the county in which he's moved, that's where you file the paperwork, he'll get to take his assessed value of $1 million with him and continue to pay property taxes as he was in his own, um, in his own home, old home. So, uh, you know, next here we have an example of what if Jason moves to a more expensive home? How do we do the math there? Okay, so this is, uh, this is where there is, you know, additional benefit than what we had under prior law. In this case before, Jason would have been, have been out of luck. He would have just had to, you know, bite the bullet. He wanted to move up. He would have paid substantially more in property taxes. So in this case, the way this is computed is he's got his, uh, you got to look at the difference between the two homes. So 6 million minus 4 million is 2 million. And then that 2 million gets added to the old assessed value of 1 million. So Jason will pay property taxes on 3 million. The old assessed value plus the difference in the value of the, the two homes. Okay, good to keep in mind. Yeah, so still much better. 3 million uh, taxes on 3 million is better than 6 million. Absolutely. All right, so uh, you know, switching gears here, we have received a question. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read it here. If memory serves under current law, you can sell your house to your child and the child gets to carry over your property's assessed value. However, if your child gets the assessment, you cannot then buy a different house and then use that same low assessed value. I assume that this only one person gets to benefit from the low assessment thing remains true but it's worth knowing for sure. Yes. So basically, can you have your cake and eat it too? Yeah. Which so we all want. In this case, you know, you can't. So if you sell your house to your child and they take your assessed value, 
uh, you're out of luck if now you're moving to a new home and you wanted to carry your tax basis you know, with you. Your child has it, you pass the baton on to your child, they take your old basis, but you're going to have to start over with your new home and uh, that will be considered change of ownership and you'll start paying taxes based on the value of your new home. Okay. All right, so I have uh, a couple more examples here uh, of transferring our uh, assessed value for those older than 55, uh, you know, victims of disaster, the disabled. You know, first we have someone that inherited a home under Prop 58, but then sells it under Prop 19. You know, what happens here, Judy? Okay, so this is different than the prior example where we said you, you couldn't use your exemption twice. But in this case, now we're talking about uh, the transferee. So we've got Anne who inherited her mother's home in San Francisco and she made the home a principal residence um, and she maintained her mother's assessed value under Prop 58. Uh, Anne is now 55. She decides she no longer wants to live uh, in the home that, you know, that she grew up in. She wants to downsize and sell her inherited house. Uh, but before she was worried, you know, uh, you know how I have this low tax basis. I don't want to move and pay higher property taxes. So now, as long as Anne moves, uh, meets the necessary requirements under Prop 19, she can still transfer her assessed value to a new home. So she'll still get to carry that old assessed value forward. She got it from her mom and she can carry it forward under Prop 60. I'm sure that's a big relief to some folks out there that are, are in this position to, to hear that that can continue. So, to reiterate, this aspect of Prop 19, you know, transferring the assessed value, you know, if you want to move within California, you're over age 55. This all starts after April 1st, 2021. So, uh, Judy, what is your advice if folks are already considering a move? Well, for some people, if you're considering a move, I mean, I think that you would clearly, if you haven't done anything yet, you're going to want to wait until. Uh, uh, you know, after April one, unless you're in the same county or you're under the old rules and you're, you know, you're, and you're moving uh, down and you're clear that the new home will be um, a fair market value of the same or lower. But if it's even close or you're not committed, uh, you, you know, you probably want to wait. And so a variation on this, you know, we had a client, um, this was um, a uh, situation that was brought to me that Celia, she had um, bought a $2 million condo, $2 million condo in Santa Barbara uh, last October. She planned to move there as a principal residence after she sold her home of 30 years in Palo Alto that had an assessed value of 300,000, but was currently worth uh, 2,500,000. But she hasn't yet sold her home. So she's bought a home in Santa Barbara, uh, but she has not yet sold her Palo Alto home. Uh, Santa Barbara is not one of the counties that has an inter-county ordinance, so they don't accept any sort of uh, reciprocity. Um, and basically, she had been prepared to pay the higher property taxes on her condo. Um, so she, she certainly can, but um, something that she may wish to you know, consider is that she could hold off on the sale of her Palo Alto property and still wait to hear. Maybe the BOA will, BOE will say that... Uh, uh, only one part of the transaction has to be done after April 1st, or maybe they'll say that both parts will have to be done after April 1st and she's out of luck. But, um, you know, if she's buying a condo or if she bought a condo and then there's similar condos, uh, if it's in a complex or there's other places that she would like to live, uh, other than, you know, having to pay some transaction costs, she could also consider selling that condo in Santa Barbara uh, and then waiting Till after April 1, buying another condo and then sell her property so that both parts of the transaction will be done uh, after the effective date. You know, so we keep stressing the importance of getting more guidance from the uh, Board of Equalization. You know, you know Judy, if, if you had a guess, you know, how soon can this come, right? We, we're, we're pressing up against really close dates, February 16, for parent file transfers, April 1. Um, for moves for those over age 55, you know, when can we expect something? Well, it's hard to say because I read that the legislation, uh, there's a certification, you have to get legislation certified. And I think the certification date is December 11th. So we haven't had, we don't even have that date yet. I do believe that the people at the Board of Equalization are working on it. Uh, they've removed from their website, if you go on their website and look for their assessor's handbook that has all these 
the rules for under the old laws, they've removed the handbook from the website. So you can't find the handbook. I mean, people have copies of it, but it's not up on the website. So I believe uh, they're working They're They're really, really smart people there. A lot of them um, have been there for years. Uh, they're very, also very approachable people. That's been my experience in, in my practice. You can pick up the phone, you can call them, you can ask questions, but I think they're, they're, they're trying to figure it out. And also it's evolving. I mean, and what they come up with now, no one can think of every scenario that's going to arise. And um, laws are made based on uh, cases. And uh, the way that a lot of this could happen is, you know, just for an example, someone dies, uh, you know, tomorrow, but the, the estate, and so you think they'd be under the old rules. They own a home, it's going to go to their kids. Um, but the trust is, has to be administered and, you know, debts have to be paid and assets marshaled. The assets are not going to be distributed and the paperwork's not going to be completed until after the effective date. Um, the people, when they do do the deeds, they may file for the claim and say, you know, they died before the effective date. I'm entitled to that. Uh, the assessor may either accept that or deny it. Uh, if they deny it, uh, they may be, there may be litigation and say, no, it should have been because we died before that date. And that's the way the law evolves. So I know it's very difficult uh, for uh, everyone, attorneys, the, the clients, everyone who owns property and wants to do the, you know, the right thing for their family. Um, but we just have to do the best that we can and, and hope for the best. Uh, that's the motto for 2020, Judy. <laughs> Judith. All mm -hmm. right, so you know, we've covered a lot of ground here. Is there anything else that we should consider for California Prop 19? Well, I think we have to, uh, you know, remember that, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of a two-sided proposition. Uh, part of the uh, reasoning behind it was to generate additional revenue that uh, the counties are struggling, the property taxes raise, raise money. Um, there was also the California Fires Fires Fund that was set up that's going to receive a portion of these proceeds. So um, I think that, you know, there's good news. We've talked about the good news here about being able to downsize or upsize and take your tax bases with you. But the days um, where you could transfer your property to your children and uh, if it was rental property and they could continue to, you know, rent the property and, and have low uh, costs associated with the property because the property taxes are low, um, it's not going to be like it was, uh, at least for the time being. So stay tuned. Okay, so Judy, thank you so much. Um, you know, we've covered everything we wanted to address on the agenda, but uh, the most important thing is to answer some of these questions. And, and I know as we've been speaking, there's some been some uh, movement in the chat. So David, I'd like to turn it over to you. You know, what are we seeing in the chat room? What are we seeing in terms of questions from our attendees? Uh, thank you, Michelle and Judy for today's presentation. And before we transition to the Q&A session uh, quickly, I would like to share that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you soon. Um, we'll send an email with a link to the video and please feel free to share the presentation with those who you think might benefit from watching it as well. Um, so we have received some questions. And the first one is what qualifies as a primary or principal residence? For example, if a residence is rented out short-term via Airbnb or long-term for nine months, uh, to a professor on sabbatical, for example, does it still qualify as a primary or principal residence of the parents if they resume residence after this res uh, after this rental? All right. So, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, generally the definition of primary residence is the residence in which you reside in which you claim the homeowner's exemption or a disabled veteran's exemption. Uh, each county's uh, qualifications as to what qualifies for claiming the homeowner's exemption can be sometimes slightly different, but generally it's where you intend to live, uh, where you get your mail, uh, where you're registered to vote in that county, where you have uh, your address on your driver's license. Those are all factors that go to whether or not you qualify for the homeowner's exemption. But the definition of principal residence, I think the easiest way to look at it is the residence that you have applied for and received the homeowner's exemption. If you then rent it out for some very short period, you haven't negated your homeowner's exemption. Um, if you do that long term and you're gone for several years, you know, it typically wouldn't qualify for the homeowner's exemption any longer. Thank you, Judy. 
Um, next question. Another tax benefit for children who inherit a residence from their parents is the step up of the tax basis upon death, which virtually eliminates long-term capital gains taxes for children who inherit a residence from their parents and then sell it under current law. If Biden Harris take office on January 20th, do you expect them to eliminate the step up of tax bases as currently provided in the tax code? I can't say for certain on um, Biden's tax uh, platform proposals, there are many things. Uh, there is uh, a lowering of the state and gift tax exemption. There is a perhaps a change or an increase in the uh, uh, state and gift tax rate. For, it's currently 40%. There's talk about increasing that rate. Uh, the repeal of a step up in basis is on the list. Um, I think we'll know more in January after we have the Senate uh, races uh, decided in, in Georgia. But personally, I think that's one of the more remote possibilities. Um, it's certainly a possibility, but I would expect um, a lower exemption, perhaps a higher rate before a repeal in the step up in basis. But it, but it could happen. Next question, how does Prop 19 impact rental property? All right, so uh, basically with rental property, there's no more uh, option to transfer after February you know, 15th, the tax basis. Um, as we talked about with primary residences, there is an opportunity uh, to transfer the tax assessed value depending on the uh, value of the property whether it's more or less than a million dollars and whether the child moves into the property. But the rule where you could transfer a million dollars of assessed value for other property, which includes rental property, has been eliminated after the effective date. Thank you, Judy. Um, I also wanna make a quick note. We realize we're over time and we have uh, questions that continue to come in. So we appreciate you being patient with us. Um, we will actually attempt to get back to everyone who has asked a question. So um, we do plan on getting back to you. We're gonna continue here um, for another question or two, um, and then we'll wrap up our time with you today and then address those individual questions individually. Uh, so the next question, Judy, is, is it possible that future legislation may reverse or counteract Prop 19 and what considerations should be made so as not to lock your, yourself out of options? It is definitely possible that there will be future legislation that will either affect uh, the property tax rules. Uh, as you saw at the beginning of the presentation, we had a host of propositions. Uh, that from the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, that expanded rules. Now we're talking about limiting rules. So the answer to that is yes, it is very possible. Um, you know, flexibility, it, that's what people are looking for. You know, flexibility, what can I do now to uh, preserve all my choices? And I guess my answer to that is it really depends on your particular, you know, situation, uh, your family situation, your financial situation. And uh, I, my best advice is take your facts and talk to a professional about your particular situation. All right, one more here. Uh, is there a property tax reassessment benefit if within a family trust, if there's a lifetime trust created for the child or children that inherits the property from parents? When the transfer was made to the lifetime trust for the benefit of the child, that was a change in ownership and uh, hopefully the proper paperwork was filed and uh, under Prop 58, the prior assessed value was transferred to the new owner, the trust for the child. You have to look at the terms of the particular trust, but if this was a trust that said when the child dies, then the property passes to the child's children or the grandchildren, that will be deemed a change in ownership um, and there will be reassessment. Uh, the caveat on that would be looking at the terms of the trust uh, and see if anything else was going on inside the trust. But generally, when the child dies, there would be a reassessment before a pass to the grandchildren. Excellent. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Judy. We appreciate all of the work that you've put into today's presentation. Um, also, thank you so much for attending. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact your client service team if you are a BOS client. And if you are not a BOS client and have additional questions, please feel free to reach me directly at david.newson at bosinvest.com. Uh, from all of us at BOS, we wish you a healthy and peaceful holiday season. 
and a happy new year. Um, one last thing as I close um, is another disclosure. This presentation provided a general overview of California's Proposition 19. Since an appropriate strategy depends upon your specific objectives and circumstances, please consult with your legal, tax, and financial professionals to seek appropriate advice for your particular circumstances. Things are evolving as we speak as Prop 19 was just passed over a month ago. We expect the Board of Equalization to also offer further guidance. Again, for further questions, please reach out to me, David Newson at david.newson at bosinvest.com. Thank you so much for attending today and be well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.